out there. All right, Matthew chapter 2. We'll take just a minute this morning, and uh, we've been talking about uh, the promise uh, and, and all that uh, it involves and what uh, it uh, entails. We've talked about uh, the promise anticipated, how uh, the Jews for years had been looking for uh, the Messiah to be born, how they had been looking, uh, waiting on the Messiah to arrive, uh, how the, the promise was ultimately uh, announced, how that uh, when Christ was born, uh, he was announced. Last week we talked about the arrival uh, of the promise. And this morning uh, I want to take just a few moments and talk about uh, the adoration, the promise, uh, adored. Uh, how the wise men, when they arrive, uh, that uh, they come and, and they fall on their, uh, on their face uh, and they worship uh, the Messiah. And as we look at that, uh, uh, the question comes as we think about that, uh, you know, we have, uh, we need to take a little bit of background uh, and consider a moment these, uh, these men we know as uh, wise men, what we think about them. Uh, we honestly, we don't know a, uh, a great deal about them. We, uh, over time, uh, some people have given them names uh, and assigned them names, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't know that. Uh, we sing We Three Kings. We don't know. Uh, they they may have been kings, but we don't know. Uh, we're not even completely sure where they're from. Uh, they're from the east, but uh, that could be a lot of places. And uh, generally, it's assumed they are uh, from somewhere around Iran, Iraq, Yemen, in that uh, area that we know today. Uh, but they were um, the word that uh, that they come from. The word magi, uh, as you might imagine, uh, ties closely into the idea uh, of magic. Uh, they were somewhere between what we might call an astrologer, uh, uh, an astronomist, a magician. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways we look at these men. Uh, what we do kind of uh, understand about them is that they were uh, truly wise men. That they were, uh, a word that you and I might use would be philosopher, might be uh, a good word in, in our day and age to, to describe these, uh, these men. Uh, we don't know how many they are. No, no matter uh, how much we sing we three kings of Orient are, uh, we don't know that there were three. We don't know uh, if there were 33 or two. We just we don't know their number. As you might imagine, they've been assigned a number uh, because there were three gifts, and so we assume each one uh, was carrying a gift. Uh, but three of them could have been carrying gold, and three of them could have been carrying frankincense, and one of them could have been car- carrying myrrh. We don't know. Uh, the number of gifts does not clearly uh, indicate how many uh, they were. Uh, what, what I think is important to understand uh, is that these three wise men uh, are, uh, are not not what we would uh, expect, really, uh, to be gathered around uh, the Messiah. Uh, it's interesting to me, as we talked a few weeks ago, uh, about the shepherds. We have uh, the shepherds who, by all intents and purposes, we can say uh, were the bottom rung of society. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the opinion that most people had of shepherds, uh, they probably couldn't even reach the bottom rung. I mean, these were uh, the bottom layer of society, uh, and uh, again, that's not my opinion. That's just uh, their status in, in their uh, in their society. Uh, the wise men, uh, again, being philosophers, astronomers, astrologers, uh, were aware, uh, were uh, knowledgeable of pretty much all religions. That was uh, the kind of their their uh, their strong suit. They were uh, students. They were uh, they were aware. They were knowledgeable uh, of pretty much all religions. You could have went to uh, uh, to one of these wise men and said, tell me what the Methodists believe. And they could have told you what the Methodists believe. You could have said, what do the Baptists believe? And they could have told you what the Baptists believe. You could say, what do the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, and the Catholics? What do the Buddhists and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons? You could have, uh, they, they could have talked uh, fairly intelligently about most any uh, topic, in particular uh, religion. And one of the religions they were aware of uh, was Ju- uh, Judaism. They were aware uh, of the Jewish uh, religion and the way uh, the, and their teachings, and so uh, as they see this star uh, that uh, they report, uh, the Bible tells us that they eventually uh, they make their way uh, to see the Messiah. Now, contrary uh, to every nativity scene you have ever seen in your life, including the one in my front yard right now, uh, the wise men uh, were not 
uh, at uh, the cradle side the night uh, of the birth of Christ. They, uh, they just couldn't have made it that quickly. At best, uh, it was several months, and some even think uh, a few years later, that these, uh, uh, that these students, these wise men, uh, these teachers, make their way to, uh, to, to see uh, the Messiah. When they arrived, the Bible tells us that they worshipped Him. They adored Him. And there's three things that, uh, very quickly, I I want us to draw out of that story uh, and make a parallel this morning as we consider uh, our Christmas, as we consider uh, what we do uh, at Christmas, how we uh, carry out our Christmas. This is certainly uh, not an exhaustive uh, list out of this story because it's a great story. Uh, But out of Matthew chapter 2, there there are three things uh, that I want you to notice about uh, this story uh, about worship about adoring uh, Jesus Christ. One of them is, is that there was a prepared place. Second thing that I notice uh, in this story is there is a proper posture. And then the final thing I want us to look at is that there is a pleasing present. Those three things are, are again, just the three uh, that I want us just for a moment to, uh, to draw out and look at and consider uh, in our Christmas celebration, and our Christmas worship uh, at this time of year. First thing, uh, again, that I notice is uh, that, that uh, there is a uh, prepared place. And I, I don't know, there it is, okay, uh, a prepared place uh, that, uh, that we have. Notice what it says uh, in, in verse 11 uh, when the Bible tells us there that when they came to the house, uh, when they came to uh, the house, the Bible already has told us, if you back up, uh, that they say, we have followed His star. We saw His star, and we came to that, to that location. We came uh, to that place. And so the first thing that I notice here is that there is a prepared uh, place of worship. There is a place uh, that, we, uh, that we worship. Now, uh, I want to be quick to say before I go too far that I understand and I realize that we can and we should be able to worship at any point, at any place, anywhere, anytime in our life. Uh, there is certainly uh, worship available, uh, opportunities for worship available everywhere. You might, uh, there, there's probably very few of us this morning uh, that have it stood on a balcony at the beach and watched uh, the sun come up over the ocean and, uh, and the beauty and stood there and just kind of been uh, awestruck and, uh, and give God the, uh, the glory for the beauty. You've, uh, you know, you, you've stood and, uh, you know, and, and perhaps uh, beautiful flowers, perhaps uh, at the birth of a child, a grandchild, uh, you know, we, we see those things and we are uh, awestruck and reminded uh, of the, the power uh, of God. We are awestruck and reminded of the glory and the greatness of God. And certainly there are plenty uh, of opportunities and uh, for us to worship. And to be very honest with you, if the only time that you can find to worship is at, uh, at an assigned time in an assigned building on an assigned day, you're missing it. Uh, you're you're missing the most of it uh, because there is certainly uh, all kinds of things around us uh, to worship. There are uh, there there are people this very day who will be worshiping under a tree uh, out in the middle of a, a village. There are people who will be worshiping in storefronts. There will be people worshiping in their homes and uh, in fine fancy cathedrals and uh, in regular ordinary church buildings. There are uh, there are all kinds of uh, ways and things to worship, but I, but I think that one of the lessons that, uh, that, that the, the wise men show us here is, is they came to that house, they, they, they came to that place, they followed that star to a place of worship. Now, just as much as I believe that you can worship uh, on the beach, as you can worship, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, at beautiful flowers, looking at your grandchild, uh, just as much as I can believe you can worship in, in nature, uh, just as much as I, I believe you can worship laying in a hospital room uh, with tubes and IVs. I believe that. I also believe that the Bible is very clear that we are not to ignore the opportunity to gather ourselves for worship, to come together uh, for a time of corporate worship. Now, I I have people tell me that all the time, and and I have to agree with them. Oh, I can worship anywhere. You're right. You can. Absolutely. I I believe that. Uh, I, I wouldn't argue with you for a moment, but I also know that the Word of God tells us that just as these wise men came to a particular place, 
that we also see that time and time again, we have statements like, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We have the example repeatedly uh, in the New Testament uh, of the church meeting. Yes, sometimes it was in a house. uh, Sometimes it was in a church building. Sometimes it was out in the middle of nowhere on a hill. But whatever, there was an organized time of worship. There was a time uh, organized to uh, set aside every day or every week to say this is the time that we are going to worship God. And I think there are so many reasons for that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, about the story I, I know you've heard before uh, of the man who uh, they kicked him out of the choir because he had got bad hearing, he's tone deaf, he couldn't teach anymore because he couldn't see his Sunday school book. Uh, you know, they, they wouldn't let him take up the offering anymore because he walked too slow. Uh, you know, that, that pretty well, uh, you know, they took him off all the committees he'd been on because he couldn't hear what they were discussing. And, uh, and, and somebody asked him, said, why do you keep going to church? Said, They've taken everything. They won't let you do anything. He said, oh, I know, but I just want the devil to know whose side I'm on. You know, uh, there's, you know, there's a certain amount uh, of we organize just to say to the world whose side we're on. There's a certain amount of we gather just to say to the world that rides up and down this road that thinks that God is dead, that there are a group of people that believe He's still on the throne. I think it's important because God expects us to worship. God doesn't need us to worship. You do know that God will still be God if you never say His name again, right? God will still be God if we lock up the doors and we never never gather here again. God is still God. He doesn't need our worship. He desires our worship. Now, why in the world would a God that's still God want a bunch of uh, you know uh, 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 rednecks to get up and, and sing? You know, I, you know, I love to hear some of the way we butcher up some songs. You know, we, you know, we, we'll, we'll put the southern spin on them babies. You know, uh, you know, you ever, you ever go to a church? Yeah, any of you ever been to a church? You know, may, maybe kind of a little fancier. That's got one of them great big old pipe organs and and a way better music, way better looking music director, uh, and, and all. And they sing the songs the way they wrote. I don't even recognize them. You know, I, you know. You know, there's, there's power in the blood, not power. You know, I don't even recognize them when they sing them the way they wrote and pronounce the words right. I don't even know what they are. You know, God doesn't need that. God enjoys that. God enjoys that. Why? Here's what I, I've discovered. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. Some of you may not believe this, but I'm just going to tell you. They Sunday mornings I get up and go, I don't want to go. Hey, Sunday morning as the clock goes off and I want to bounce it off the wall. You know, be honest, you do too. You know, they Sunday mornings at the clock and I'm thinking, boy, I just don't feel like it. That Archie's going to be there. You know, I just don't want to go. You know, I, man, I don't feel like it. I don't feel good. Been a long week. My head hurts or whatever. You know, you, you know all you got to do is give it about that much and before long you've got about this many reasons, you know. And finally, Rondo come in there and shove me out of the bed, make me get up, you know. And I'll get down here, and I said, I told you I'll go. I'll sing my way to church, you know. And that just makes Caleb's day, you know. I, you know, I'm telling you, that just makes it. He, he, what he really looks forward to is every Easter. I'm telling you, every Easter, it, it, it is a requirement. It is a tradition that every Easter on the way to church for the sunrise service, I sing. What a beautiful day for the Lord to come again. And Caleb just can't wait. He's already looking forward to Easter for that this year. You know. And so I, and you know, problem is, you know, one of the problems with my singing is I know every song there is. I only know about three words of them though. And so I tend to string them together. You know, just my, and, and you know, by the time I've sung my way to church, and I get in here and I laugh at whatever Archie's got on that morning, you know, now I walk around and I talk to a few people and we had the early service and sing and I you know what? There's been a whole lot of Sunday mornings. I got up, didn't feel like being whooped. And by the time church was over, I didn't want to go home. Yeah. Why why does God want us to worship? It's good for us. It's good for us. You can see that in the shepherds. You see that in the wise men. What happens? It says that after the shepherds and after the wise men met Jesus, after they worshipped Jesus, what does it say? They went away glad. They went away rejoicing. They went away different than they arrived. 
Listen, the wise men teach us that there is a prepared place. Do not forsake the worshiping of Jesus Christ, especially this Christmas season. I'll tell you something that somebody pointed out the last time, and I'd never thought about it, and I don't know how often it's happened in my ministry, uh, how often, I guess, every six or seven years that Christmas falls on Sunday. And somebody pointed out, isn't it odd, uh, how on the one day, on, on, on Christmas Day, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, that generally we close the church or most people are not there at all. You know, think about it. You know, the very day that we celebrate the birth of Christ, we spend it somewhere else. Prepared place. Second thing I notice is there's a proper posture. Notice what it says. It says they came in and they kneeled. They came in and they fell on their face. I, I want you to understand this morning that I, I'm not so worried about your physical posture. And I, don't, I, know, I know God's not. They kneeled, they fell on their face. Some kneel, some stand. Some sit, some run. Some shout, some never make a sound. You know, I, I've been in church services where there might be one or two making laps around the building. There might be another handful sitting there. You know, somewhere between reverence and rigor mortis. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, real close. There's a fine line between the two. You know. I, 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 you know, I, I've been where, you know, when the music was going, uh, some were, you know, some were clapping their hands and some were sitting there, you know, holding their hands. You know, you see them every now and then their arm jump. They want to clap. They just afraid they'll lose their spot, you know. You know there's all, I don't think the physical part, but here's the thing that matters, the prepared part, the posture. What about what's internal? Can I share something with you that, Crossed my mind as I studied that thought in that passage. Most of us spend more time getting ready to come to church than we do getting ready to worship. Most of us spend more time doing our hair, our makeup, polishing our shoes picking out the perfect outfit, tying our tie, all doing our hair. Again, for some that's easier than others. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we spend more time getting ready to come to church than we do getting ready to worship. Let me just get you to do a little calculating in your head. From the time we left church last Sunday... From the time we left here, oh, I'll take it back. We'll, okay, I'll give you a whole week. From the time we left church last Sunday till you arrived here this morning, I want you to think for a moment, and I'm not trying to, listen, I've got to put myself in this same boat. I'm asking all of us this question. From the time you left last Sunday till you arrived this morning, how much time did you spend in prayer for your teacher, for your preacher, for the choir, for the musicians, for the spirit of worship, for the congregation, for souls to be saved, lives to be changed, burdens lifted, any form, fashion of time spent preparing for worship this morning. Compare that to how much time we spent preparing for church. Some of us spent longer running around the house looking for our Bible that we haven't seen since last Sunday than we did preparing for worship. Now, granted, I can look at you and see some of you spent a lot less time. You know, look at Archie. You know, he's going, if I'm telling you, if I turn up missing, it's Archie's fault. How much time do we spend preparing for worship? How much time did we spend in the last month, two months? Some of you are psycho. You've been getting ready since last December the 26th, getting ready for Christmas. Buying presents, wrapping presents, making lists, checking them twice, figuring out who's been naughty and nice. Generally, that's not too complicated either, is it? We spend more time getting ready for Christmas than we do for Christ. We spend more time preparing and thinking about, I got to get this person this, and I got to, who's still on my list, blah, 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 blah. Got to get my lights up, my tree done, my ham cooked, blah, 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 blah. Got to get my cards out, I got to, blah, blah, blah. All the things that come as part of Christmas. 
And somehow, the part that involves Christ gets pushed to the side. Prepared place, a proper posture, and pleasing presence. Now, I have heard people make a lot, uh, a lot of emphasis and a lot of uh, to do out of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, and, and you can. There are a lot of analogies, a lot of things you can draw out of those three gifts. That's not my point here this morning. I, I'm just simply going to say this about those three gifts. You don't get much better. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they're pretty much, that, that's, you know, that's the Cadillac of Christmas gifts. You know, that, that's, the, that's, that's the top of the line when it comes to gifts in, in that time. You just, you just didn't give them. I mean, let's be honest. Somebody gives you gold today. That's pretty much, you know, you just don't get gold. You know, you don't give gold to the mailman, do you? I mean, that's just, uh, you know, that's, just, you know, that, that's kind of a, a, a fancy gift. Here, here's something I thought about about gifts. Gifts say two things. When we consider a gift, we consider, first of all, that says something about our own self-concept says something about what we think of ourselves. I, I don't want to give a gift that causes somebody to unwrap it and goes, what kind of moron picked this out? Right? You know, let's be honest. You go to the store and you look at something and you say, I can't give them that. You know, they'll think I'm an idiot. You know, they'll think I'm a cheapskate. You know, you, you, know, you walk through. Uh, and so it has something to do with our own self-concept. You know, we, we want to give something that, uh, you know, let's be honest, whether you, you know, we may not want to admit that, but we want to give gifts that say something positive about us. You know, you, you, know, you don't want to, you know, men, you, you don't want to give your wife a pack of juicy fruit for dantine or whatever for Christmas. It just, you know, uh, it just won't work, okay? Uh, you know, you might be, now a lot of y'all here remember, I, I, I love this story, uh, a lot of you remember Richard and Willie Ramsey. You might be like them, and, and I'm going to do my best Richard imitation. Richard, what you getting Willie for Christmas? Nothing. Is that, is that pretty close, those of you that remember Richard? Was that pretty close? Nothing. Richard, you can't do that. Why are you not getting her anything? I got her something in 1962, and she took it back. I hadn't bought her nothing since. You know, and, you know. <laughs> if it's a story he told it, that's all I'm telling you. But we give gifts that say something about ourselves. They all. We also give gifts that say something about who we're giving them to. We also we look at the gift and we match it up. We, we give a gift according to who the recipient is. Don't raise your hand. There is not a person in this building, unless you've never Christmas shopped, which that, I guess, is possible. There is not a person in this building who has never walked through the store, picked something up, and went, oh, that's nice. I think I'll get that for, for Archie. Whoa, that's too much. <laughs> He's not getting that. Am I lying? You know, you know, you've walked through the store and said, i got to get my boss something. That looks pretty... <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would, you know. <laughs> Let's be honest. There's something about, you know, first thing's our self-concept. The second thing we think of is who we're giving it to. You hopefully have enough sense to give your wife something nicer than you give, you know, the mailman or whatever. You know, you, hopefully, you know, I, I would think most of us, when we're looking at gifts, we buy our children nicer gifts than we do our, our, our nieces and our nephews. Just stands to reason. Why? We give a gift that not only says something about us, but something about who the person that gets the gift is to us. My grandmother, not the one that's sitting here, I won't tell any bad stories on her like putting pineapple in sweet potatoes. Um, I promise never to tell that she did that and ruined sweet potatoes ever again. But... Um, my grandmother, my other, my daddy's mother, had a daughter-in-law that, um, how do I put this nicely? Hated, couldn't stand her, stink, stank, stunk like the Grinch, um, you know, as nicely as I can put it. I don't remember if it was Mother's Day or Father, uh, Mother's Day or her birthday. For some reason, her daughter-in-law sent her a card. I personally didn't see a problem with the card. It was a nice card. 
On the front, it had like a yellow bouquet and white flowers and yellow flowers and a little dish. And in that dish were some lemons and there were some lemons laying around on the table on a, like a yellow tablecloth under it. And it said, you know, love you Mother's Day and you know, blah, 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 right in the front. Just real beautiful. My grandmother interpreted that to mean that her daughter-in-law was saying that she was sour. You know, that was how she interpreted that card. And she left it for a long, long time sitting on the washing machine in the kitchen. And if her name came up, the story of the card came up. In fact, the story of the card just came up on a regular basis. Because in her mind, that was what that card said. Now, me being me and having the gift of... Charity and love is what I was thinking. You got to remember, I was the only grandchild, you know... On both sides, I could about say it. It wasn't like they could knock me out of being the favorite. You know, even when I, you know, even when they were mad at me, I was still the favorite. So, because I, I was it, and I said something one day. I said, you know, different times I would take different jabs. I'd say, well, Mama, have you been sour to her? <laughs> she had the rheumatiz, and it would flare up when I say things like that. But we do that. We, we look at gifts and we, we think that way, whether we're giving or receiving. The wise men brought the very best they could. They didn't bring lemons. They brought the very best they could to the Messiah. Really simple question this Christmas season. Does God get our best or does God get what's left over? Do we go through the store of our life and go, whoo, that's too much, I can't give him that. That's way too much. That's asking too much. That's too much time. That's too much dedication. That's too much work. I can't give him that. Do we adore the promise? There's a prepared place, a proper posture, and a pleasing present. And that pleasing present is nothing short of our very best. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. This morning you're here, and you've never accepted this gift of the promise. You don't know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. You need to come this morning and let us show you from God's Word how you can know Him. How you can accept Him as your Savior. You hear this one, you say, Jimmy, I know I'm a Christian. But this Christmas season, I want to put Him first. I want to make sure that in everything I do, in my family gatherings, and all that I do, that I give Him my very best. Maybe you want to come this morning, this Christmas season, and you just want to kneel and say, Lord, I just want to thank you for giving your best, for sending your Son to save me, for sending your Son to that manger and ultimate of that cross that I might have salvation as we stand together.